Now, you probably won't be surprised to hear that the water coming out of your pipes doesn't simply travel from a nearby river. In most cases, it has to go through a lengthy process before it's safe for you to drink or use it when you shower. But there's a part of the scientific community that has some concerns regarding how we treat this water before it's good enough for human consumption. You see, there are countries that are still using substances in these water treatments, which might not be the best thing for our DNA. The culprit in this debate seems to be colloidal silver. This is a mineral that's been used in medicine for a long time because it can get rid of some germs. However, it may do more harm than good. Also, there isn't a lot of evidence that it actually works to disinfect the water. And now, researchers are warning that there's a risk that it could actually cause damage to the DNA. The research looked at previous studies where the effects of silver, silver nitrate, and silver nanoparticles have been measured. And while none of the studies alone are definitive, the researchers think that there's a chance that silver-treated water could damage our DNA. Now, official guidelines for drinking water quality don't currently include a value for silver in water. But they do suggest that a very low concentration could be tolerated without risk to health. The bottom line? We need more research to determine if people who drink water treated with silver have evidence of DNA damage. Until then, yeah, maybe we should stick to other ways of treating contaminated water just to be on the safe side. Now, hold on a minute, what's DNA anyway? I'd be asking that myself too if I were you. Let's talk about the real OG of molecular biology, deoxyribonucleic acid, or as we like to use easier acronyms, DNA. You might have heard that it's the building block of life, and that's true. DNA is like the ultimate instruction manual for all living things, from the tiniest microbe to the biggest elephant, and even me. But DNA is more than just a set of instructions. It's also the ultimate family heirloom, passed down from generation to generation, like your granddad's antique pocket watch. And just like the pocket watch, DNA has been around for a long time, dating back to the earliest life on Earth. Now, let's get into the nitty-gritty of what makes DNA so complex. It's made up of smaller elements that fit together like puzzle pieces. And when those puzzle pieces are arranged in a specific order, they can create everything from the color of your eyes to the size of your feet. Mm, I must have gotten more of that one. But how does it all work? How do we get information from these tiny puzzle pieces? Well, that's a bit of a mystery that scientists have been unraveling for decades. But one thing we do know is that DNA is a true team player. Every cell in a multicellular organization has a full set of DNA. The interesting part is that on an average day, our precious strands of genetic code can get pretty shaken up. A single cell can suffer up to 10,000 mishaps in its chromosomes within just 24 hours. But don't worry, most of these little accidents get fixed up good as new, like a handyman with duct tape. However, some of this damage can result in permanent errors, also known as mutations or rearrangements, that can lead to some not-so-fun conditions in the human body. In fact, some studies suggest that DNA can get damaged by some of the most surprising things, like salt, for instance. Turns out that if we could technically sprinkle too much salt on your DNA, it could cause some serious damage. But don't worry, it's not all doom and gloom. As soon as the salt level gets lowered, those breaks start getting repaired. The only thing is, scientists are not exactly sure where these breaks are happening or what kind they are. And speaking of salty environments, there's a tiny microbe varmint called Halobacterium that lives in the Dead Sea and can teach us a lot about biotechnology and even life on other planets. That's because this little critter is quite the overachiever. In fact, Halobacteria may hold the key to protecting astronauts on a mission to Mars from one of their greatest threats, space radiation. This can be harmful to the DNA in astronaut cells, potentially causing illnesses. But Halobacterium appears to be a master at repairing damaged DNA, and scientists want to learn from it. The researchers at the University of Maryland have conducted a series of experiments to test the limits of Halobacterium's power of self-repair using cutting-edge genetic techniques. Even after having their DNA completely fragmented, these little organisms are able to reassemble their entire chromosome 
and put it back into working order in mere hours. But why is Halobacterium such a tenacious survivor? Well, it turns out that it naturally lives in some rather inhospitable places, like ultra-salty bodies of water, such as the Dead Sea. In this area, most sea life would quickly shrivel up and fade away. But Halobacterium has evolved to cope with this salty lifestyle, and this could explain why it's so good at surviving radiation and other types of damage. In some experiments, the researchers exposed Halobacterium cells to beams of intense UV radiation, which would have completely destroyed most microbes. Yet 80% of the Halobacterium cells survived and went on living and reproducing just fine. In other experiments, they used a vacuum chamber to expose cells of Halobacterium to a space-like environment, and the tiny cells became trapped inside salt crystals, which protected them from additional damage. Some scientists even claim to have found living cells of Halobacterium encased in salt deposits that are more than 250 million years old. If true, this could have profound implications for the hunt for microbial life on Mars, given the data from the Mars Explorer rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, that suggests the Martian surface once had pools of salty water. Now, if you think about it this way, sure, salt and salt water in particular can damage DNA. But it can also help us understand more about how we can survive in harsh environments. There's still a lot we don't understand about human DNA, that's for sure. But did you know that you and I share a whopping 99.9% .9 of our DNA? We're almost genetic twinsies. I mean, think about it. You might have a dashing smile or a gorgeous head of hair, while I might have the most adorable dimples or the ability to recite every line from my favorite TV show. It's true. But at the end of the day, we're all made up of the same basic building blocks. It's that 0.1% of DNA that sets us apart and what makes life interesting. We also might have more in common with a cabbage than we'd like to think. Turns out that our DNA is 50% the same as that leafy green veggie. But don't worry, it's not like you're going to start sprouting leaves or anything. Actually, it's pretty cool to think about how every living thing on Earth evolved from the same ancestor over 4 billion years ago. And that ancestor was probably just a tiny single-celled organism with a coil of DNA. From there, it evolved into everything, from teeny tiny bacteria to humans with trillions of cells. Now, how about our closest animal relatives? Well, that award goes to chimpanzees and bonobos. Recent studies have shown that bonobos share just as much of our DNA as their chimp counterparts. But here's the kicker. Despite sharing about 99% of our DNA with these primates, we humans still act and look a lot different from them. Well, some of us. The researchers who sequenced the bonobo genome found some small yet intriguing differences in the DNA of the three species. These differences might just be the key to unlocking the mystery of why these wonderful creatures don't behave or look like us, despite being such close relatives. Actually, I have a cousin who acts pretty much like that. Remember the Neanderthals? Our superstar humanoid cousins of the Pleistocene era in all their wide-nosed and slope-foreheaded glory? They roamed through Europe and Asia for over 350,000 years before they vanished. This was around the same time our ancestors, the Homo sapiens, decided to take a vacation from Africa and explore the world. We may never know what truly happened to the Neanderthals and why they didn't make it to the present times, but thanks to some hefty archaeological digging and impressive fossil finds, we now know a bit more about them. One theory for their disappearance is that the climate wasn't suitable for them anymore. Supporters of this idea think Mother Nature turned on the Neanderthals and sent them packing. Unfortunately, if we look at Neanderthal archaeological sites in Italy, for example, there are no signs of weather catastrophes that could have wiped out this entire species. Others believe there was a bit of resource competition between Neanderthals and humans. That's why specialists also dug around several other archaeological sites where Neanderthals and sapiens might have rubbed elbows for about 3,000 years. In this case, it does seem that the Neanderthals were a bit behind with their tools. Their technology was like flip phones in the age of VR. But who knows if these two species ever crossed paths in that particular region? The evidence is still fuzzy. 
How they went extinct isn't the only information we're curious about when it comes to Neanderthals. Other scientists, for instance, are trying to decode some of the Neanderthal molecular barcodes to identify their specific traits, some of which you might share, believe it or not. Sure, Neanderthals as a whole species did, in fact, go extinct. But that's not to say remnants of their DNA can't be found in humans. Now you know how things go when folks live near each other. Some genetic mixing was bound to happen. The evidence? A dash of Neanderthal DNA which was found in modern folks. Now, this is where the plot thickens. Scientists thought that since Neanderthals never lived in Africa, their DNA wouldn't be found in modern African populations. Well, it turns out that African people have about 0.5% Neanderthal DNA too. This doesn't mean our Neanderthal relatives simply teleported through African territories without leaving any trace behind. What this discovery actually implies is that early humans might have visited Europe, mixed their genetic material with that of Neanderthals, after which they returned to Africa. That's a lot of migration. How did we stumble upon that Neanderthal DNA these days, you might wonder? Well, scientists gathered thousands of people from all around the world. Participants came from places like East Asia, Europe, South Asia, America, and Africa. Percentages may vary, sure, but around 20% of the good old Neanderthal DNA is still found in U.S. modern folks. Sure, the average Joe only carries about 2% of that caveman swagger. If you're from certain places or families that have a smidge more Neanderthal in their gene soup, you're looking at 3% tops. Is there anything in particular that we share with our long-gone humanoid cousins? As it turns out, our Neanderthal ancestors gifted us more than just their company for some thousands of years. They also passed down the incredible legacy of their noses. Well, you see, the Neanderthals were outfitted with some seriously high-rising sniffers. These weren't just cosmetic, they were also quite the asset in chilly climates. The icicle-dripping, teeth-chattering kind of cold where your breath could freeze before it leaves your lips. During those days, the Neanderthal noses worked as personal heaters, warming and humidifying the cold, dry air they inhaled. For that kind of extreme weather, these impressive nasal skyscrapers turned out to be quite handy. When our Homo sapiens ancestors decided to leave the sunny savannas of Africa for a spot of frostbite up in Eurasia, they bumped into the Neanderthals. This encounter resulted in not just an exchange of pleasantries, but also an exchange of genes that coded for larger noses. This newfound genetic nugget was discovered by scientists who dug deep into the DNA of over 6,000 volunteers. To complete the study, these scientists meticulously compared this genetic data to snapshots of the volunteers' faces. They measured the distances between various points on each face, such as the height of the volunteers' nose bridges. They then played a game of spot the genetic marker to identify if certain facial traits were linked with specific genes. By the end of this exciting chase, they hit the jackpot 33 shiny new genome areas were linked to facial features. One standout gene, named ATF3, was traced back to our Neanderthal ancestors and seemed to be the maestro of controlling nose height. Participants with Native American ancestry had Neanderthal hand-me-downs in this gene, contributing to their taller noses. Think of the ATF3 gene as a Neanderthal housewarming gift to us humans as we stepped into colder climates from Africa. Interestingly, this isn't the first time our ancestors have played past the gene. Back in 2021, the same research team uncovered a gene influencing lip shape called TBX15. This gene was a little love note from the Denisovans, another set of our ancient relatives, who lived in Asia and went extinct around 30,000 years ago. Another part of the scientific community believes our Neanderthal buddies had this weird genetic feature when it came to their brains. Is that why they didn't make it? Through this theory, it was suggested that US humans might owe our brainy edge to a quirky gene mutation. This mutation gave our neocortex, that's the smarty pants part of the brain, a little population boom in the neuron department. This amazing gene of ours isn't all that different from the Neanderthal version. It's just one amino acid off. Just like ordering a coffee with one sugar instead of none. This tiny tweak is found in virtually all modern humans. Meanwhile, our extinct relatives, the Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other primate pals, all missed the mutation memo at least according to the study. Now, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Just because we have more neurons doesn't necessarily mean we're geniuses by comparison. 
But these results do suggest that we might have rewired the brain in a way that gave us a cognitive leg up. Also, it's not all about this lone amino acid difference. It's just a piece of the puzzle. Scientists have previously found a whopping 96 differences between our DNA and that of Neanderthals that could have potentially affected our different outcomes as species. Studying Neanderthal DNA also gave us some insight into their relationships. In fact, we now have some solid evidence of what a Neanderthal family looked like. And surprisingly, it's not really that different from ours. For this study, researchers gathered information from a Neanderthal archaeological site located in Asia. They discovered that one particular family included a doting Neanderthal dad, his teen daughter, and a sprightly young lad who was possibly their nephew or cousin. Part of the group was also an older female relative, maybe an aunt or granny. Now, our young damsel would eventually pack her bags, wave a teary goodbye, and leave her papa's home when she found Mr. Wright. Had she been a boy like her young cousin, she would have been a happy homebody. But worry not, she wasn't stepping into a world of strangers. Her new community likely had some familiar, friendly faces. But how were scientists able to predict the ending of this story? By browsing through their gene pool, researchers were able to figure out that the Neanderthal social structure was patrilical. What this means is that most female Neanderthals left their homes when choosing a partner and started a new life with another family. The same research shows that our cave-dwelling clans likely weren't living in isolation either. Families living close by were probably visiting the same rock sampling areas to make their stone tools, the equivalent of a neighborhood hardware store. And when they weren't tooling around, they were busy hunting delicious meals like ibex, horses, bison, and other wandering critters. Scientists, however, were careful to add that this ancient family portrait might not represent the full spectrum of Neanderthal social life. They've kindly asked future archaeologists to get more Neanderthal DNAs on the Ancestry websites. Would you like to have a super memory? What if you could remember any piece of your life in great detail? For example, you're walking down the street with a friend, and you hear a song. You remember hearing a fragment of this song 10 years ago on TV during the winter holidays in the Alps. You remember every celebration of your birthday, every party in your life. Sounds cool, but is it so good to remember your whole life? Let's find out by the example of a real person. Meet Rebecca Sherrick from Brisbane, Australia, who remembers her whole life. Literally, all of it. All events are stored in her mind almost from birth and she has immediate access to them. She remembers her parents put her in the driver's seat of a car for a photo just a few days after her birth. She remembers how the seat cover and steering wheel aroused her curiosity. Rebecca remembers how she started having her first dreams at 18 months old. She didn't distinguish dreams from reality and thought that she was really leaving home somewhere. That's why she always wanted her mom to be with her. She also remembers by heart a big book she read many years ago. She can easily remember how she lay in bed, looked at the surrounding toys, and how her mother approached her to feed her when she couldn't even talk and walk. She sees it so clearly as if it happened yesterday. She remembers not only visual images, but also smells and even feelings and sensations that she experienced during some moments in the past. For a long time, Rebecca lived confident that everyone in the world had such a memory. Then in adolescence, she began to suspect something was wrong with her. She noticed that she was fixated on some things from the past much more than her surroundings. It seemed to her that she had a mental disorder and she felt insecure for this reason, but she had no idea how special she was. She learned about her uniqueness at age 21 when her parents showed her a news report about people with a phenomenal memory. Rebecca was surprised that it was something special. She realized she was among the 60 people worldwide with highly superior autobiographical memory or HSM. This is a neurological condition of the brain in which a person can quickly and effortlessly reproduce in memory any fragment from life in the past. These may be some social events or personal experiences, and all of them spring up in your memory as clearly as if you're watching a high-quality video recording. Scientists are still studying the HSM phenomenon. It was discovered at the beginning of this century, and there are few objects to study, only about 60 people. The lack of information and observation slows the research process. But doctors have already learned something. This is part of the brain that helps process memory. A person with an ordinary mind remembers bright moments from life very well. In a sense, the brain of people with HSM 
records all the moments as bright ones. That's why people have such easy access to them. It was important for Rebecca to get an official medical diagnosis because she wanted a clear answer to the question of what was wrong with her and to improve her self-esteem. To confirm the diagnosis, Rebecca had to go through a multi-year study. She did various analyses and passed multiple tests. Then, a couple of years later, Rebecca returned and told the scientists about what had happened two years ago. When her case became famous, she revealed the dark sides of her gift, which she also calls a curse. So, HH Sam seems like a cool superpower, but there's a bad side here. Do you know that moment when you're lying in bed and suddenly remember something embarrassing that happened to you a few years ago? For example, you disgraced yourself during a presentation or couldn't find the right phrase in an argument or behaved very stupidly on a date. So people with HSAM have constant access to all these awkward moments. You can remember every last detail of every wrong moment in life. And of course, such thoughts are pretty challenging to control. Imagine how difficult it will be to fall asleep if you start remembering and reliving bad moments in life. It would be hard not to go crazy after years of such a life. And the problem is not even in the most minor visual details, but in the repeated reproduction of feelings and emotions. Someone said something hurtful to you, or you saw scary pictures on TV many years ago. All this can pop up in your memory many years later if you have H. Sam and return the same emotions to you. If Rebecca remembers a stressful case when she was three years old, then as an adult, she will experience this case as a three-year-old girl. Such emotional swings contribute to the appearance of depression, anxiety, and stress. And the more negative emotions you accumulate, the harder it will be for you to fall asleep at night. That's why Rebecca takes great care in life. She understands that any unpleasant thing can remain in her memory forever. She takes medications to control the incoming information and goes to a therapist who helps her avoid bad situations. Imagine that you need to think ahead about every step in your life. Should I watch this movie or not? Go home the other way? Read this dude's Twitter thread. This makes you too cautious and severely restricts your life because you know these moments will stay with you forever. Perhaps you would avoid risks so as not to fail. And such a life reduces the chances of success in every way. Yeah, it's cool to have H.S. Sam if you were born into a wealthy family, travel a lot, have no health, mental or social issues. Everything works out for you and you're always happy. But let's be honest, almost no one has such a life. And even the rich and successful have problems. Some people with HSAM say that their memories are well organized in the brain, like books on a bookshelf in alphabetical order. But Rebecca's memory is chaotic, her brain is filled with worries. This often causes her insomnia and headaches. Perhaps this is because she also has a confirmed diagnosis of autism. But Rebecca's life didn't turn into a nightmare. Fortunately, she learned how to overcome bad memories with positive ones. If some bad moment begins to invite into her mind, she covers it with a happy piece from her life. And this is the most beautiful part of HSM. This feature in the brain helps you solve exams, learn something quickly, and remember all books and movies. But the coolest thing is the opportunity to experience happiness anew. Even if you're in a bad mood, you remember how much fun you had that day at the water park, and your brain enjoys this moment. This allows you to experience happiness every day every minute. At the beginning of each month, Rebecca selects the best moments of this month in the past years. When she returns to them, it helps to fight bad memories. Another cool feature Rebecca has learned is the ability to turn any nightmare into a happy and beautiful dream. She can build and create whatever she wants during sleep, and she can remember all her dreams. Not all people with HSAM have this ability, but some also reported they had lucid dreams they could control. By the way, the only memory Rebecca doesn't have is her birthday. She doesn't know how she felt inside her mother's belly and says she wouldn't want to remember it. Today, Rebecca lives an ordinary life. She doesn't want big changes and likes to think and feel how she's used to it. She hopes that her case will help many people worldwide, so she participates in two scientific studies that can help treat certain brain diseases.